Hello and welcome to the Fergan. My name is Dan and I'm here to try and make sense of these turbulent times from a heathen perspective. Visit fergan.com for links, information and an archive of past episodes. Hello friends, I have the honour of hosting a very special guest for this episode, John Lamb Lash. Some of you will know John's work, but for those of you who don't, allow me to introduce him. John is a renowned author, comparative mythologist and teacher, known primarily for his work on Gnosticism. His book, Not in His Image, newly available as an updated 15th anniversary edition, uncovers a forgotten cosmology which many across the world have since been fascinated by myself included. Also joining us is our mutual friend, Rob Miller. Those of you who've been following the Fergan for a while may have heard he and I in conversation before. Rob is the mastermind behind the metal band Tau Cross and formerly of legendary punk metal band Amoebics. He's a lifelong seeker of the mysteries and well-versed in Gnostic and esoteric lore. I don't think it's cavalier of me to say that you're about to hear an important discussion. John, Rob and myself spoke off the record recently and identified a tragically neglected area of discourse. The fundamental correlations between paganism and Gnosticism. Contrary to the popular view of the Gnostics as a heretical offshoot of Christianity, John Lamb Lash sees them as belonging to an original pre-Christian European shamanic tradition. John, it's an honour to be speaking with you. How are you today? I'm quite fine, thank you. Pleasure to be with you. Excellent. Uh, I've been very much looking forward to this conversation and those who followed the Fergan will be familiar with your name uh, because of the videos and uh, also the conversations that um, myself and our other participant tonight, Rob, have had in the past uh, where we have uh, referenced your name and your work. And Rob, we've had some very positive feedback on our past conversations. So how are you doing? Dan, very well here. Thank you. And really pleased and honoured to be um, in such a lost Chris company this evening. So looking forward to see what we can wring out of this. Yeah, me too. So um, following on from the introduction there, I think a good opening topic would be um, most people listening to this, who many of whom will be uh, of the pagan faith or tradition themselves, they know Gnosticism as world renouncing and as far as they know it's not compatible with the life affirming uh, tenets of paganism so john would you mind um just speaking to that a bit perhaps um you know if you bear in mind that many of the listeners won't be familiar at all with uh, gnosticism or your work on gnosticism so if you feel like giving a, a brief or you know as brief as possible introduction to your interpretation of gnosticism and then perhaps we can talk a little bit about how Gnosticism isn't world-renouncing, as many believe it to be. Well, yes, that's an excellent place to start. And I would say it's the necessary place to start due to the very great fact that the profile of Gnosticism and Gnostics and the entire phenomenon of antiquity that comes into the world today that reaches most people is contaminated. It doesn't represent who the Gnostics were. It doesn't represent the mysteries accurately. And you are absolutely right. You use the word world renouncing. Scholars use the word anti-cosmic in their scholarly jargon. And that's the way of saying that in their interpretation of what the Gnostics believed or knew, uh, the Gnostics took this radical stand uh, that they were against the world, that they uh, considered this world we live in to be sort of a matrix or a trap for the divine spark, and uh, that matter itself was evil 
And this world has been created by the demiurge, which is in some respect not a genuine deity. That profile, that portrait that I just uh, summarized in a few sentences is a terrible deterrent for people to come in and investigate and learn the true character of the Gnostics and the value of their message today. You see, that profile of the Gnostics is the disinformation that comes from the early Christian fathers, the Christian ideologues who hated them. And there was a battle in the early centuries of the common era in which the enemies of the mysteries, which is an age old tradition going back to the shamanic roots of the Aryan Celtic peoples, uh, was demonized. And so, unfortunately, unless people encounter my book first, which gives them an alternative view uh, of the origin and purpose of Gnosticism, they're going to run into that profile. And that's going to leave them with the impression that Gnosticism could not possibly have anything to do with a nature worshiping, earth loving perspective. Very unfortunate. Yes. Um, the, I mean, the reason that your work has resonated so strongly with me uh, when I first came across it, um, well, nearly, probably nearly 10 years ago now, um, was because, precisely because of this point, my understanding or my misunderstanding had been that Gnosticism is world renouncing. Um, actually, my only real um, meeting with Gnostic ideas prior to reading Not in His Image was uh, via a movement that's, that's actually prevalent within the extreme metal scene. Uh, called anti gnostic, uh, anti cosmic Luciferianism. So uh -huh. it's, it, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the, the word anti cosmic there. Yeah, um, and the the way that uh, Gnosticism is presented within this movement is to say that uh, yes, Yahweh or Jehovah uh, is the false evil demiurge, and actually the uh, Lucifer who dwells beyond the cosmos is our true creator uh, imbuing us with the divine spark so um you you can understand that coming from that perspective to reading your book um was quite a leap uh, and i imagine many of those listening to this will probably be similarly confused as to how these two almost opposite ideas can can reconcile reconcile with one another well you know <clears throat> one way to understand it and this is a problem that has existed for centuries. As I say in my book, there is no system of philosophy or thought and no narrative that has ever been produced by the human imagination that has faced more opposition, demonization, and demolition than the Gnostic message. It is the most opposed message in all of history. And of course, when people come to the Gnostic message, if they don't have uh, something to compare it to, they think if they listen to Graham Hancock, for instance, who is a friend and colleague of mine, talks quite a lot about Gnosticism lately. Uh, if you listen to him or any number of other people, you get this picture of the anti-cosmic perspective. They rejected the world. They renounced the world matter is evil, we're all caught in a dark matrix. That is not at all the true message of the Gnostics. So what I did in my book, and thankfully it seems to get across to a lot of people, is I brought out the message of the Gnostics on their own terms, not from the viewpoint of Judeo-Christian scholars who perpetuate the misinformation about them. Indeed, yeah. And you mentioned Graham Hancock there. And, you know, some of the listeners will have heard the term Archon uh, because it's become almost a meme at this point um, in our modern age. And, and people may not realize that John is largely responsible for um, kind of uncovering that term and bringing it, bringing it into the discourse. And you have the likes of uh, David Icke and uh, Jay Widener and, and people like that who've used this term quite a lot. And 
someone like David Icke, I mean, he is essentially uh, a world renouncer in the sense that he he says that uh, th- this is all illusion. Uh, we are all one, and um, you know, we, you know, I, I, I don't know the, the finer details of his um, his worldview, but people who listen to him might get the impression of this Gnosticism being this world renouncing thing. Um, but if I could just ask, uh, I'm really interested, Rob, in your uh, kind of journey with this. You know, did you have a misunderstanding of Gnosticism yourself before coming across John's work, or? Um, you know, what was it like for you? I would say almost identical to what you were talking about, where if I'd gone into this at any level at all, you always find this allusion to uh, Demiurge, Yahweh, um, being the um, yeah, the creator of the world. And therefore, you know, through 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 um, uh, negation of, of all the, the, the sort of primal uh, urges that you have, you, you need to get yourself out of here. So, yeah, it was confusing. And it wasn't really until really not in his image that I had any idea about what we were looking at and the the scope and breadth of that uh, as the underlying reality and story of um, our part, our place in this universe, really. Mm. Yeah, interesting. I bet it's quite a common journey that people well, of have been course, on. Yeah. Of course, you can imagine, say, some relatively intelligent person who, takes an interest in Gnosticism and they look around on the internet or they buy, they read maybe five or six books, maybe they read 10 books. And these books are all going to reinforce the uh, disinformation profile on the Gnostics. So then when they see my book somewhere or someone mentions it or it pops up on the internet, they're going to think, well, you know, I've I've read 10 books about Gnosticism. Uh, I don't read, don't read to need don't need to read another one, but this is precisely the one you need to read if you're interested in Gnosticism. And at least then, if you read my book, you have something to compare to the other version. Okay. Sorry to be so emphatic, but you get my point. Yeah. Rob, what were you saying, Rob? I was just, but yeah, very broadly agreeing with John there. And, um, trying to get across how important it is to be able to to get a different perspective from that. And I'm, I'm just wondering um, who was really responsible for this uh, propaganda um, at, at, the early, um, at the early instigation of, of Christianity? Well, Hippolytus, Epiphanius, Irenaeus. You could probably make a list of, at the top of the list, there would be uh, say five names of what were called the heresy hunters because Gnosticism was considered to be and is in fact the greatest heresy of all time but it is a heresy of truth so they considered Gnostic doctrines and practices to be heretical who is they? the early Christian ideologues so you could start with those writers like Irenaeus who have left an account of the Gnostics, but the account is titled Against Heresies. So I've compared the work of Irenaeus, which is uh, a source of information about the Gnostics, but I've compared it to the dossier of the prosecution. So how much truth are you going to find in the file of the prosecution if you're trying to look at the character and actions of the defendant, you know? Until now, there hasn't been anyone to defend Gnostics on their own terms. Not till I showed up, as far as I know. And uh, Sorry, uh, go on, John. No, that's it. Um, I I mean, it it almost seems to me, and and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it almost seems like you can draw, in comparing Gnostics to the pagans, it's almost as if when we talk about the pagans, we are talking about the people who lived pre uh, the emergence of Christianity as a religion. And when we're talking about the Gnostics, we're talking about pagans who almost had to rebrand themselves and were persecuted during uh, the early era of Christianity. Do you think there's anything to what I'm saying there? Well, Gnostics were pagans, yes, but they were intellectual pagans. Right. So they not only uh, let's say, 
met the qualifications, if you want to use that term, of what a genuine pagan today uh, would consider to be necessary, you know, reverence for nature, uh, <clears throat> the perception that all is alive, animism, uh, uh, the study of the stars, it's tremendously important. They were great astronomers. Study of the stars and the seasons, uh, communication with the telluric forces of the earth, and everything that you can put into a basic checklist. And you would say, yeah, that, 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 and that is pagan. It defines the attributes of paganism. They had and they had intellect. They were intellectual pagans. So they were the great educators and teachers of the ancient world. The mystery schools were the spiritual universities of the ancient world. And so the mystery schools arose at a certain time and took the form, arose in very ancient times. I trace the roots of the Gnostic movement back to about 6,000 BC in Northern Iran. People who uh, founded the, what later became the, the Gnostic movement were Aryan Caucasians, Persians from Northern Iran, right? And then when it developed and it, the movement developed and grew into a network and at a certain moment, which is a really critical moment uh, in antiquity, uh, when literacy came to be popular, you know, if you read any study of uh, ancient history, like ancient Greek history or the Middle East, you say, okay, this is an interesting development. Oh, at a certain point, uh, alphabets, uh, secular alphabets were introduced and people started reading and writing. The Gnostics were the teachers who introduced literacy. They educated the entire uh, Mediterranean uh, the world around the Mediterranean basin. The, the great Egyptian teachers were Gnostics. So it's, it's a generic term for a class of teachers who had a strong intellectual component in what they did, but they were rooted in the worldview of paganism. And they worshiped the earth under the name of a specific figure. So that's my profile of them. And unfortunately, uh, you know, I, I think I did a talk on my YouTube channel where I said, how come uh, I don't get invited on a platform uh, to sit at one side of the table? And then all the other people today, like Graham and Greg Braden and David Icke, who are presenting their perspective of narcissism, can sit on the other side of the table and let the world know that there are two versions of it so that people can choose which one they like, which one appeals to them. But I don't get invited to those conversations. That's, that's because you're a heretic in the true sense of the word, John. Yeah, and that's also because I talk about something that they never talk about. But, uh, <laughs> We yeah. might not go to that in this particular conversation. No, that, well, if it, if it becomes relevant at some point, of course we can, but um, yeah, we'll see. Um, yeah, I mean, Gnostic ideas were, uh, were found among the, the Pythagoreans, the Platonists, Zoroastrians, Egyptians, the, uh, the her Hermeticists. Um, it's, it's really kind of an umbrella term, isn't it? It can be, but it's also, I maintain that it is better if we define it quite specifically, because it can be used loosely. You know, there's a the longstanding joke is that in, what was it, 1986, all of the prominent Gnostics, Gnostic scholars in the world met in Messina in Italy. It's called the Messina Conference. 1986, by the way, was about 10 years after the Nag Hammadi Library appeared in English, okay? So they had a worldwide conference and they spent, I don't know, three days or three weeks and they could not come up with a common definition of narcissism, mm. you know, but I do have a very clear and specific definition of who the Gnostics were. And you define them by uh, their belief system, by their narrative and by what they taught. That's yeah. how I define them. 
Well, yeah. speak, speaking of, would you be so kind as to give us uh, as brief as possible or as, you know, as concise as possible, uh, an overview of the fallen goddess scenario? So the the kind of central, um, you know, foundational myth of, or you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, a poetic myth of Gnosticism? Yeah, it is the guiding myth of the Gnostic movement. And uh, one way to introduce it is to show how uh, to to, uh, illustrate what I consider to be the fundamental refutation of the view that Gnosticism is world renouncing. It considers this world to be a trap, a matrix, and it considers matter to be evil, right? The creation of of an evil demiurge, right? The best refutation of that is found in bits and pieces throughout the Nag Hammadi texts. But principally and ironically, the best refutation of that can be found in the works of Irenaeus. Now, Irenaeus was a Christian ideologue who wrote a book, attributed to him anyway, probably a compilation, called Against Heresies. And as I said before, you consider it, you can consider it to be the dossier of the prosecution. So he's compiling a case against the Gnostics to prove how perverted they were and how they were dangerous heretics. But in the process of condemning them, he has to, in a way, represent their view, right? He has to represent the view of his opponent in order to argue against it. Can you see that? Yeah, right. And in, and you have to read Irenaeus and these other uh, heresy haters like uh, Epiphanius and Hippolytus very, very carefully, because in some respects, they represent the views they are opposing held by Gnostics accurately. But in other respects, they do not represent the views of the other side accurately. But to the extent that they do, you find in Irenaeus that he said, that the Gnostics said that there was a supreme goddess from the galactic core, they call it the Pleroma, a galactic scale divine entity called Sophia. And they were most interested in her because they recognized in her through many generations of investigation and study that she is the indwelling spirit and indwelling presence of the earth. And it says in Irenaeus, and also in certain passages in Nag Hammadi and elsewhere, that she turned into the earth. So how can it possibly be that if Sophia is the central figure of the Gnostic movement, and they see her as a galactic scale goddess who morphed into the planet earth, how can they possibly consider matter to be evil? And how can they consider the earth to be a place where the divine spark is trapped in an evil matrix? You see, it's impossible. So the fallen goddess scenario is just that. It is the elaborate myth, which is a sacred story, not a fiction, about how the earth came to be the origin of the human species, the origin of the archons, the way that the earth came into existence today. According to this narrative, the earth was not created by a god. It is the body of a goddess. And if that doesn't resonate with every heathen and pagan in the world, then I'll eat my socks. (laughs) Yeah. How can it not? How can it not? You know, I I said to Dan and and the three of us when we were talking the other day, getting to know each other, I said, I consider it a great tragedy. This book has been out for 15 years. And when it came out in 2006, uh, I was thinking, because I've always had a real fond spot for pagans and heathens and, you know, Wicca and that sort of thing. Although I think some of the things they do can be quite silly 
And I think there's a fair amount of fraud in the movement, such as Margot Adler and uh, Starhawk, who were very, very big, you know, you know. But I embrace the genuine grassroots spirit of paganism and the heathen way of life. Absolutely. I am of that root, same root. And I thought, wow, I can't wait. Just wait until the people in, in that movement uh, hear about this. It's just going to be like a marriage made in heaven. You know, this is so great. They're, they're just going to love this story because it brings everything into a cosmic perspective. And it puts the goddess Sophia, the divine earth mother figure, at the center of our cosmology. And so, yes, the Sophianic narrative is like the umbrella under which all the varieties in the spectrum of paganism can meet and recognize each other. And that's also, my friends, what it originally was until all those indigenous movements were shattered. And when they were shattered and attacked due to Christianity and Islam, they lost coherence. And this narrative, the biography of the living earth, which explains our purpose in this world, brings back that coherence. It restores the whole pagan worldview to wholeness. Yeah, indeed. And, and this is why, this is why I, I prefaced this conversation by saying that I think it's an, an extremely important one. Uh, and it's something I'm so, I'm so uh, glad and honored to be having because for me, um, there has always been a connect between my heathen worldview and John's presentation of Gnosticism. And it does seem like an enormous travesty to me that these two uh, schools of thought have not been brought together in, in such a way until now, really. Um, well, yes. Well, I said to both of you in that previous conversation, I, I was waiting for someone for 15 years. I, I think one woman in 15 years wrote me, found me on an internet interview, of which there are dozens and dozens, and said, well, I'm a practicing Wiccan, and uh, uh, you know, I, I read your book, and I find that your view of the, the pagan character of the Gnostics is uh, really credible, really solid, and very compatible with my practices. One person in 15 years. Yeah. I, I, you know, where is Asatru? Where are the people who are in these movements in Europe and the United States who are going back and trying to reclaim their ancestral roots and pick up the fragments of their indigenous wisdom of their ancestors? Why aren't they coming to me? Why aren't they attracted to this uh, book? And I think we already answered that. It's because the disinformation gets in the way. They don't even know the book is here. They don't have a chance to see if there is a deep compatibility between this version of Gnosticism and their practices. And that is a tragedy. Well, I would agree with you all together on that. Um, I'd also draw, draw attention toward the sort of commonality that myself and Dan have, which is within the, the alternative kind of, I guess, broadly speaking, metal um, community of musicians and all that kind of stuff. And funnily enough, you find a lot of people who are interested in um, in the mysteries broadly, paganism, heathenism, this, this kind of stuff, uh, deeply embroiled in that particular scene too. So there's almost like a, there's there's an audience there which um, not a lot of people um, have access to as well. So it's it's. It's it's interesting as well to come back to what you were saying earlier on about this the perception of the negation of nature and the anti human um, uh, the anti human interpretation that was given broadly speaking to to Gnosticism by by the authorities um, and something has gone on which uh, Dan and I talked about as well within the music scene and it's been this push. Um, toward a, a sort of mythan, misanthropic worldview. Um, and again, uh, it can be perceived as anti-human, anti-nature and very negative as well. So I think both of us 
have um, a degree to say about that as as musicians. And for for my own part, you know, with um, your work itself has been highly influential in at least a couple of albums that I've put out, and I've tried to try to interpret what you say as best as I'm able to within a sort of three four minute song, and try and put these ideas out and across to that audience. So I'm hoping that some people have picked up on that, and I've certainly had a lot of feedback both for you know the, the work of John Lamb Lash and and also interest in people like Valet and 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 John Keel who we we mutually talk about from time to time. Yeah. Well, Sorry, go I on, certainly appreciate that you've done that because for artists, musicians and artists and creators to absorb the Gnostic intel, as I call it, and to learn and love the story of our living mother, the Aeonic mother, we call her by all kinds of names and nicknames for her, but you know, they call her the Aeon Sophia, the goddess Sophia, her name means wisdom, that if that mystique of Gnosticism could seep into the scene, <coughs> excuse me, of music and arts, it would be wonderful. It, do you know Omnia? Uh, the name so, rings a bell. Is that a band? Yeah. It's a Dutch band that oh, does. Yes. A, yeah, yeah. Right. They were very big. I haven't heard about them. I haven't looked up uh, them up in a while. But some years ago, I think it was like eight or nine years ago now, uh, I got in touch with them on the Internet. I sent them a copy of Not In His Image because they're doing all of these. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Wouldn't you say there's a genre I can't name the groups, but you might know them. They're Swedish or Norwegian groups. You see the video, you see them all dressed up. They're wearing antlers. They have drums. Oh, yeah, you're speaking about Halung and Wardruna. Yeah, and there are quite a few groups like that, aren't there? Yeah, and, yeah it's become uh, very popular. Right, and Omnia was very, very big. And uh, they were always dressing up in, in uh, they wore, you know, genuine pagan gear in their, performances and uh, did songs about, you know, Earth Warrior was one of their really big hits. And uh, so if people in that genre could pick this up, it would be tremendous. Yeah. Well, just to go, uh, yeah, what, what Rob was saying there about um, the, the metal scene being kind of full of this misanthropic negative vibe, um, I think maybe this is one of the reasons why you know, a reasonable number of metal musicians are interested in, uh, you know, John's uh, presentation of Gnosticism and, in my opinion, should be because it's still heretical. You know, I mean, let's face it, as metal musicians and punk musicians, we are generally drawn to the heretical. You know, we we, we have this kind of um, this rebellious streak which wants to go in the opposite direction of mainstream society. But what the fallen goddess goddess scenario offers to people like us is both a heretical mythology that is also extremely positive. It is. It's beautiful and inspiring. It's not a black pill uh, Mm. way of life. Mm -hmm. On the contrary. Um, And I find that in all the years now since I wrote my book and since I've been teaching planetary tantra, which might be called the practical application of Gnosis today, because this is not a nostalgia trip. They're not going back, you know, to antiquity and relive Gnosis. It has to be lived anew today. Since I've been doing that, I can tell you that what brings people toward this message and keeps them there is it is so beautiful and inspiring. I mean, this story about Sophia and what happened to her and how the human genome was created and how the human genome is propagated uh, through many worlds and the particular conditions of the divine experiment we're in here uh, on the earth now and the role of the archons and where they came from and how they work into our world as an intrusive and parasitical factor. I mean, it's brilliant vastly complex and beautiful story but yeah. people just fall in love with it yeah and and before you Simple know I, that. 
uh, yeah, <clears throat> I can imagine that some of the the pagans listening will be thinking, right? You know, I've been listening for a while now, and I'm yet to hear any any real evidence to suggest that this this is similar. But let me remind, particularly those who follow the Germanic Norse uh, tradition, that we have in the Prose Edda, Snor- uh, um, Snorri Sturluson's Prose Edda, we have the 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 uh, the cosmo uh, cosmological uh, myth of uh, Althumbla the cow, um, f- you know, being the progenitor of this world. Um, and as John mentioned in our private discussion, um, you know, there, there is perhaps a case to be made that Althumbla and Sophia are one and the same. There is indeed, there is indeed a case to be made. And I have expended enormous uh, effort to try to show that <clears throat> in the Sophianic narrative, the following got a scenario. I also call it the home story, uh, which I had to restore. I had to recover and restore it because it had been so attacked and demonized that there were only fragments of it left. But through the Nagamadi and other Greek, Egyptian, Coptic, Syriac, Iranian texts, I was able to reconstruct it into a coherent narrative. And what I find is that in some ways, the plot and the factors in the Sophianic narrative in some ways can be seen to correlate with the gods and goddesses and the events in the Icelandic and the Nordic and Teutonic mythology in some ways. But I say that with a great, great caution. And so I want to say that I find, for instance, what you mentioned, Dan, is, is to me irrefutable. There's no doubt that the Nordic, indigenous Nordic peoples, they saw in the figure of the great cow mother and who gives her milk, who nourishes the earth, they saw their version of the Gnostic Sophia. And I can prove that and I have proven that. But unfortunately, it's not possible to make those correlations consistently. And the reason, and it grieves me to say this, but I have to say it to be honest to any pagans who are listening, pagans, heathens, Nordic revivalists, the state of your spiritual legacy from your indigenous ancestors is in such pitiful ruins that it's very difficult to make anything coherent out of it. Mm. And that is a very great problem. But I think that if we recognize that problem, then we can say, well, we all recognize the same divine source, which is Mother Earth. He's the supreme divine source in Gnosticism. And so is that could that possibly be a strange attractor? Could that possibly be the point around which we meet, the campfire where we meet? And then we can see if these things fit together. But I have to tell you, it's not easy to fit them together uh, very often. I've done the best that I can because I am a comparative mythologist after all. No, you it's are my job. You you are right. There there is there is uncertainty in uh, in in the pagan um, you know source material that we have left to us. I mean, if I could give one example, in you know we have uh, Loki, um, Loki Larfersen, uh, who is the, the the brother of Odin and it, even today in uh, among uh, heathens we have um a difference of opinion as to whether loki is a negative or a positive force or whether he is both whereas in gnostic lore as i understand it there is there is no um there is no question mark over the archons and their um their purpose or their uh, their modus operandi um so i think what we have in the in the Norse law is we have we have many of the names and we have many of the the stories, but we have um, little kind of um, I would say little little kind of opinion or, or hard kind of affirmative uh, decisions as to what things did represent. So a lot of it is left down to our interpretation. Whereas uh, as I understand it with Gnostic law, if you know how to read the Gnostic scriptures. Um, you start to find, and I think John found that you know it's all actually quite certain. Yes, it's clear and it's exact yeah. and comprehensive. 
So I found the plot of the Iranian narrative comes from Persians. Persians are white Caucasian people. Do you know, by the way, have you ever heard this? I just want to throw this in because this is quite delightful. Hmm. Most people, many people may have heard of Ossetia. You know where Ossetia is? Ossetia. It's in the uh... Caucasus Mountains. You, you don't hear much about it. There's north and south of Ossetia. Right. So they're in the heart of the Caucasus Mountains. Uh, and it's my view that the homeland of the Gnostic movement was in the Caucasus Mountains north of Iran, okay? So okay. Ossetia, you hear about it sometimes like in Russian politics. It's like Chechnya, you know. It, it's a little uh, tribal kind of area in that part of Russia. Well, it so happens that it has been shown uh, both by philological research and also by uh, historical research in antiquity that the Ossetians, who were in ancient times called the Alani people, and they're related to the Scythians, are of the same race as the Irish, the Irish today. And, and there are pictures of Irish men and women living today in Ireland, and uh, uh, who, which are identical to the people living in Ossetia. Mm. And so I make the point when I locate the origin of the Gnostic creation myth, uh, in that area, that it was the matrix of all of the white indigenous Indo-European people, additional to the northern matrix. Right. Fa yeah. Is fascinating. It? And uh, actually that. So there was a northern matrix. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no. Finish, on, please. Well, big story and big things we're talking about. And there, there's a lot to cover uh, in this introductory talk. But again, if I might you know, offer, uh, uh, make a peace offering to, you see, one of my disadvantages, this is serious, I can't converse with you about how pagan heathen views and practices are compatible with Gnosis, because I don't know what they are, because I don't know what they're doing. What is, what is a heathen creation myth? I don't think there is one. I don't, I don't find one, and I'm a comparative mythologist. And I've read, read them all. Where, where is a coherent, comprehensive, clear, and actionable heathen creation myth? Where is it? Uh, you mean aside from the, you, you know, the, the story of Althumbla and the Ginninga Gap and the, the, you know, the meeting of fire and ice to create, you know, to create matter as we know it and the, the primary That's the creation gap. story? Uh, yes. I mean, there's, there's more to it than that, but... Uh, yeah, uh, unless I'm, an, I'm misunderstanding what you're... No, I'm, I'm saying yeah. I, I have not had the opportunity, which I would love to have, yeah. to sit down to meet someone who says, okay, I'm dedicated to heathen views, I go back to the indigenous it, roots. This is, and, yeah, this is as, far, as far as we know, this is the creation story as, as given to us in the, the uh, Poetic Edda and the Prose Edda. Uh, we have uh, we have out, uh, the Ginunga Gap from which matter emerged by the meeting of fire and ice, and then we have the primeval cow Althumbla, uh, from whose uh, teats uh, the gods and and the giants were fed, and then we have Ymir, who was slain by Odin, Billy, and Vey, uh, uh, and from from him the earth was created. You know, so we have a, a slight difference there, uh, perhaps with Gnostic lore. And then, indeed, from who created the earth? How did the earth come to be? Who are the gods? How do you distinguish the divine gods at the level of uh, the, the galactic level? Is mm -hmm. there a definition of the gods at the galactic level compared to what happens in a solar system compared to what happens on the Earth? Are those well, distinctions clear? Uh, other than knowing through the, throughout the mythology that the gods and the giants, or the Jotun, as they should rightly be called, because uh, giant is a bit of a misleading term, um, we know that they have generally been at odds the entire time. We know that the Jotun all descend from Ymir, uh, whereas the gods and goddesses descend uh, directly from, uh, I believe, Buri, who descends from a a Althumbla. So the, but essentially there are two lineages, um, both of which go back to Althumbla. And that is the kind of most uh, obvious uh, defining factor between the, the gods and the 
the giants. Um, and the, the gods have their home in uh, Jotunheim, and they are. Where constantly... is Jotunheim? Well, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that, that's a topic in its own because uh, you know, yeah, yeah, we have right. the nine, we have the nine worlds of of heathen law. Um, most people believe that they are symbolic, um, or perhaps they are different spiritual realms as opposed to physical places uh, that we can name within the cosmos. Well, as I said, I'm at a disadvantage, and I I must admit that I probably can't converse with you. Uh, adequately or in a proper way, because I don't really see, from my viewpoint, how any of that is a coherent cosmology. It sounds to me like a chaotic fairy tale, which has symbolic meanings attached to it. And please, if I'm wrong, correct me. But I can tell you for sure that when you look into the Gnostic myth of the Aeon Sophia, it don't look anything like that. Nothing. It's very specific. It yeah. describes something that happened in the core of this galaxy at a certain moment, and it describes the ensuing events that led to one of the divinities of the core, which the Gnostics call an aeon, uh, emerging from the core of the galaxy and eventually morphing into the planet Earth. It's a totally different kind of story, but it's a story that is real. It's an astronomical myth. Mm. Maybe it would help if I said this one thing, and I would say anyone listening to me who hasn't heard about this for the first time might find that I'm not being terribly helpful or coherent. But let me tell you this. You can take this away. The Fallen Goddess scenario is a myth that describes an astronomical event, which is the expulsion of a plasmic jet from the galactic core. That's what it actually describes. But it puts it all in animistic language. So that plasmic eruption from the core of the galaxy is the goddess Sophia. We, we don't say, we don't place her in some mythical symbolical realm. And it's all material. It's all astronomical. So it, it really it, it's, it's it bridges yeah. it bridges the the mythical with the scientific. So absolutely, to speak. it is yeah. a solid astronomical model, solid astronomical narrative. And I can't tell you, you'd have to talk maybe to someone who's been on board with me for some years. The amount of work I've done in sidereal mythology, teaching people how to read the sky, how to read the living myth of our planet and species in the sky, in real time, now. This is what you can do on the foundation of Gnosticism. It's not some made-up fairy tale that you just interpreted in one way or another. It's extremely precise. And there, and in that precision, it is, it is very powerful. And it has the ability to direct the lives of people. It gives force and direction to people's lives precisely because it is so well plotted and so coherent. And unfortunately, you don't find that in these surviving indigenous mythologies, you see, yeah, in my opinion. It, it, one, one thing that you do hear from people who are familiar with John's work is that uh, the fallen goddess scenario that he has described briefly in this discussion, uh, they, they describe that as a, a, an immensely beautiful story. Um, and it's it's actually something that's that's easily more easily remembered than the um cosmological origins of the 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 gods and and Jotun of heathen law i must admit as a heathen myself it is a it's a, a beautifully simple story and i think that's one of the reasons that it does resonate so strongly with so many people absolutely and i everyone who gets this message who who realizes that there is something called a Sophianic message and the Sophianic way of life in the world. Everyone who gets this is the same thing. This story is so beautiful. It's so coherent. It, it has a force of its own. It's like the story, the myth is like a living thing on its own terms. And it allows you to look at nature. It allows you to look at the sky. I teach a lot about the sky and the constellations. And 
to be participating in the wonder of all that in a very intense way, but also in a very clear way. You know, these other mythologies, the Nordic, the Edic, the Icelandic, the Teutonic, they're jumbled. It's a jumble of things. And I'm not saying, I'm not dissing it, you know, but I'm saying it's a, it's a jumble compared to what you find in the uh, Sophianic narrative. I would also add, if I may. Yeah, please. please I would also do, right? add that, that it's, it's something which is so essential at this particular time that we're living through right now because we, we are in a serious state. Um, things are going on right now around us, and most of us have been aware of this. You know, most of us are they're even momentarily awake to this, know that something is going on right now, and we need to be able to maintain a focus, and we need to be able to establish an intimate contact with everything that is real, um, as opposed mm -hmm. to everything which is unreal, because we are in a, in a confrontation between um, illusion, deception, and the other side of, of, of that, which is our natural inclination and our love and respect and um, the abundant sort of joy that you can have through your, your intimate contact with nature itself. And I, I just want, I'm like really emphatic about this because it, it's the feeling that I get from this, which I don't, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any problems to be encountered between um, native um, shamanic pagan mythology in any particular place and John's um, establishment of the of the Gnostic narrative uh, at all. I don't see that. I just see fragmentary pieces here and there, um, which need to be able to, as, as John quite rightly points out here, we need to be able to sit around a campfire and say, "Okay, let's let's talk this one out," because yeah. we yeah. all at that fundamental level have the, the greatest respect and joy in nature itself, and it's you know right now. All of that is is completely on the line. You know, we're we're in a critical time now. Uh, and what I would, I I very much agree, Rob. That's really well put, actually. And um, I think with especially with what's going on now across the world, uh, the 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 Gnostic myth, uh, you know, the the, the eternal truth, um, as as some people call myth, um, what that offers us is a, is actually a very clear answer as to who what and why is going on in a way which the pagan uh, mythologies don't offer in in such a clear way and you know i'm sure we'll get onto onto that in a minute as to you know sub, uh, you know the subject of the archons and what role this um, illusory force is playing uh, particularly in in you know over the last couple of years it really seems to have stepped up a notch as i think we all feel um, indeed yeah. indeed i would say that I agree with Rob. We're in a, a there's a battle between, uh, you know, real and fake. It's not just illusion. It's fake. It's fraud. Why is everything in our world, in the social world, uh, fraudulent? Everything is fraudulent. The banking system, education, media, IT is a big fraud. You know, uh, the hyping of IT and robotics, transhumanism. If you want to know what the problem of transhumanism really is about and where it comes from and how the Gnostics caught it before anyone else did and how what they said about it is valid today, then you find it in this book. And to my knowledge, you will not find it anywhere else. Anywhere yeah. else. It went, you know, many people have said over the last couple of years, you know, we've all, those of us who are awake to what's going on, we look at our friends and our family and those around us in the streets, the strangers that walk, walk past, past us on the pavement. And m many of us describe them as being almost in a trance, almost in a, in a zombie-like state. And we've, we've questioned, why is it that they seem to be viewing the, these current events in a completely different manner to the way that I'm seeing them? And I think, again, we have the answer in John's presentation of Gnosticism, because when some people talk about Gnosticism being world renouncing, claiming that you know this this entire material cosmos is itself an illusion, actually, what you find when you read John's book, not in his image, is that what John's actually saying, and correct me if I'm wrong here, John, is that this this material world itself is not the illusion. 
the illusion is placed upon it within our minds. And we're seeing perfect examples of that today with people um, who seem to be viewing this this global crisis, so to speak, in entirely different ways. Some of them are seeing it through the, the veil of illusion, whereas some of us are seeing it for what it really is. Yes, indeed. The Gnostics did not uh, condemn the world as evil. They did not consider matter to be evil. They did not consider <clears throat> this world to be an illusion. Uh, often the word, Hindu word, maya, is cited. It, maya does not mean illusion, by the way. I won't get into that. But I will mention that I incorporate a tremendous amount of Eastern mysticism and Hindu Tantra and Tibetan Tantra into uh, correlation with the practice of Gnosis today. I make a beautiful blend of those things. And the point of it all, the point of all of the work is to see the nature of evil. Because we're in an end game with evil. And it is coming to the last battle. And this, how is this evil originate? How did it develop? Well, the Gnostics were tracking this evil. They were the first ones who detected it and exposed it. That's why they had to be destroyed. Because if they could have exposed the evil of the transhumanist uh, race supremacy ideology at the beginning of the Christian era, if they could have exposed it, then we wouldn't be anywhere where we are today. We would never have got into this mess, you see. Yeah. The Rob, problem Rob, of yeah. evil is yeah. the big subject. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah I, I believe that what you... Sorry, go on, Dan. Dan. No, 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 you go, Rob. <clears throat> uh, right. Yeah, John, um, something that you have pointed out in your work is that... Um, it's almost as if the the malevolent, directly evil um, part of this equation is really something which is carried out in the human sphere rather than the archontic sphere, because that in itself tends to be um, from mischievous through to extremely deceptive, um, and um, doesn't it doesn't. It, it, encapsulate the idea of evil as we perceive it but rather that seems to be something which is uh, interpreted through the human interaction of that mind parasite yes that's correct one of the great benefits of the gnostic intel as i call it is that it explains the origin and operations of evil and big subject of course but i can make two quick points uh, which I think uh, clear the way. One of the points is that Gnosticism is not a vari variety or variant of Zoroastrianism, even though they both were of Persian origins, origins. It does not posit a cosmic principle of good and a cosmic principle of evil. According to the Gnostics, there is no cosmic evil. There is a paranormal, malevolent influence called the Archons, which is more of the nature of a parasite. And that is the mind parasite. And so evil, in terms, in the view of a living Gnostic today, evil is something that we commit. Evil is a product of human actions. However, you'll have to add the most imperative qualification that what turns human actions to evil, and we see that everywhere today, particularly in transhumanism, is a paranormal extra human influence. But it's only an influence. It's not a cosmic force of evil acting on the world. And this is the nature of the archons. And it is true, as far as I know, that I was the person who introduced the word archon to the internet. Not that it didn't exist on the internet in some form before 2002, but I was the one who introduced it in context. Yes. In the Gnostic yeah. context. Right. David Icke owes you an apology for that, doesn't he? Well, David Icke spent one of his Wembley talks 
of seven hours, uh, he spent, I think, 35 minutes talking about Nakamati and uh, the Archons and the Gnostics. <clears throat> and he kept saying, and the Gnostics said this and the Gnostics said that. Well, David, I know you've read my book because <laughs> someone was at your house and they saw it and you tapped it and you said, this is a very important book. So the next time you do a seven hour talk, you might say, John Lash says that the Gnostics <laughs> said that. OK, yeah, just to be a little more accurate. But I don't I don't bear any grudges against him at all. But again, David Icke is not capable of facing the problem of evil. He thinks it's just a frequency change. All we have to do is raise yeah. to a higher frequency and the reptilians will disappear and we'll all be living in bliss. You know, yeah. Gnosticism. Extraordinary. Goes... Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry John, come on. I'm just saying <clears throat> this extraordinary level of, inf uh, of ignorance out there at the moment about the, the the nature of the problem itself you know it's just yeah mind-boggling and disinformation within it's sort of like passing off good information uh with bad at the same time is 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 as bad as just passing off something awful in the first place so it's useless it's Indeed contaminated it well i can tell you that the people that i know who are close to me small group and the wider people in my school nemata and beyond that the wider branch around the world who have discovered the beauty and power of the Gnostic message through my work, they know exactly what's going on. They are not in the least confused about where the evil is coming from, how it works, how the archons work, and they know what the archonic infection is. And when you know that, you cannot any longer be confused by the world drama, which is taking us toward the end game. We're at the end game now with the enemies of life and the psychopaths. And in my view, Gnosis is a great medicine. And also it's the force that can inspire the warrior in this battle that we're facing. Mm. So, uh, you know, I've got some notes to follow here for this conversation, and, and I think it, it would be prudent to kind of jumble them about a bit because we're going down this direction um, where I think we could probably talk about how Gnostic law can help pagan uh, paganism to make sense of this this new kind of trans relatively new to most people transhumanist era, this dig digital control system that's emerging and has been you know, heavily propelled by the COVID narrative um, with this this idea of a cashless society, of um, new forms of digital passport, um, of, of things like that. How can, because, you know, around the time that this, um, this discussion will be published, uh, I'm performing some music at an event in London called Pagan Futures, which actually um, will be attempting to, to deal with pretty much the same question. Um, but I, I would really love to hear John and Rob's take on this. You know, what, what can we take from Gnostic law uh, at this specific time to face the this emerging technocratic control grid that's emerging? Rob, you want to put in a word? I'll have a, <laughs> I'll have a stab at it, if I may. Um, Please. Yeah, but um, I, I would just... I would say through my own experiences in the last few years where I've kind of like come brutally face to face with the wall that you do when you um, when you want to talk about things that you're not supposed to talk about in those particular times uh, where everything else was spinning out of control. And um, I felt I was personally going a little bit crazy, which I've always been. But um, what was always a grounding force was to be able to um, go out into the garden or down to the shore or touch the sea or just make contact with nature because we really need an earthing point at this time, a, li a very literal earthing point because everything else seems to come from that. It's like if you, if you earth yourself and you feel strength in that, um, you can see all this stuff coming down the line as it comes down and you can, you can just push it to one side um, or deal with it as you have to deal with it. But these, we are, we are entering a time, in my opinion, which is very, very critical. And I think we probably all share that 
an anxiety which we don't really need to be anxious about because it doesn't really matter whether we live or die and all the rest of it. It's just to have the best life that you can, not in the selfish way, but to be able to manifest the things that are within you and which you feel within your life and your world are most important. Um, to me, that's like, yeah, that's the thing. So let's be, let's be strong. Let's be brave. Let's, let's get together with people that feel uh, a, a, a kind of a sense of, of um, kinship with us. And it doesn't matter from which varying traditions there are and all the rest of it. If we can establish the fact that we all have at our centre the one pulsing heart, which is that, yeah, that we belong here and we don't want something else to try and displace us. Well, certainly, I like what you say, because obviously, if we're not grounded and we don't recognize our divine source, it's right in front of us. It's not invisible. It's not remote. You know, we don't recognize it as the living Earth Mother and bond with her and bond in communities and get out of the cities. If you want to have a life worth living, you can't live in a city. It's impossible because those are the places where they are closing down this, uh, bringing this system into its uh, culmination. All of that for sure, but as well to, re to be able to recognize really clearly, I mean, just lucidly to know where this evil comes from. Where does COVID come from? Whoever invented this and why? And what, what kind of a psyop is it? It's a psyop. And it's not the first. There are many, many psyops. 9-11 was a psyop. You know, we, some of us who studied this know this now. And of course, when you study these things, it's not easy. It can be painful. But eventually, if you're sober, you sit back on your heels and you think, well, wait a minute, where is all this coming from? <clears throat> There's a saying that I like to quote from the Nag Hammadi text, which says, whoever does not know the source of evil is no stranger to it. And that is a very big warning. It means that anyone in the world today, no matter what your conditions of life are, rich or poor, living in the country, living in the city, if you don't know, if you can't see and identify what the actual source of this evil is, then you are no stranger to it. And you may even be accessory to it. And many people are. They are accessory to it either out of stupidity or out of fear or they may belong to the executive branches of evil. And that's a really interesting subject, you see? And Gnostic teachings take you right to it. You know, transhumanism is not something recent. Transhumanism has been around for about 4,000 years. And one of the things that I do in the first six chapters of my book is I expose the historical root of what is today called transhumanism, which is nothing other than a program to either enslave or replace or eradicate the human species. It's been around for a long time. It's just now in its culmination. And all of this that is happening today, politics, the lies, the fraud, phony wars, COVID, monkeypox, all of this can be seen really clearly by the benefit of the Gnostic intel and the Gnostic perspective. Yeah. So I don't know if any pagan, you know, what does a pagan or heathen practitioner, how do they explain evil? How do they explain the COVID psyop? You know, can they explain it? I, th I think most of them, you know, just to take a stab at it, because, you, you know, I, I can't speak for the whole heathen movement, but I would right, say, of course not. I, I would say that most would look at it as essentially just tribalism. That's all that we're all that's going on. All that we're seeing with this, uh, this, this global end game takeover is one tribe or one set of coalition of tribes, perhaps. Um, trying to take as much power for themselves as possible and that their only real um yeah, their only real motive in doing this is material gain right okay hold that thought for just two seconds mm -hmm. 
This is brilliant. And I would respond in this way. Obviously, you know, obviously it's tribalism. And obviously we know what tribe it is because they've been exposed and they blow their own horns so loud. How can you not know who they are and what their goals are? Mm. But seeing it as just tribalism is not enough. What is it in that particular ethnic group that drives them to behave in that way? And what the Gnostics taught and what I teach today, and I hold by this, this is a hard line of what I teach. You cannot either comprehend or overcome the workings of evil in the world today unless you consider the paranormal factor. The way right. that that tribe behaves is inhumane and insane. Right. But why are they inhumane and insane? How did they get to be that way? How did they get to have the moral disposition to want to rule over everyone else? Where does that psych- it? Yeah. Where does that come from? Where does that psychopathy come from? Exactly. And when you know that, you have knowledge, which is power. And from that standpoint, we can see how to expose them and oppose them. Well, yes. That gets I, into very interesting territory. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and, I'm not going to take us there because this is... Uh, <laughs> well, jo- this, jo- John has this done... is the first date, man. Not, not, I won't go that far on the first date. <laughs> first base only, John. <laughs> <laughs> Just the titties. <laughs> but that's what I want to warn you. That's where it goes. You better believe that's where it goes. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Jo- John's done yeah. some. John's done some talks elsewhere before, namely with Red Ice, uh, yeah. where he, where he does go there really. And I would implore everyone to check them out because they're they're very insightful. Um, and I, I do agree. I mean, I, I think that um, you know I, I am a I am a heathen because it's my ancestral tradition. Um, but I will readily admit that I don't think that heathen law has as, as many answers to what we're facing as Gnostic law does, as presented by John. Um, and I think that's why, it, why it's so powerful because the, this, this is more than a material struggle there, you know, there are uh, opponents in this, that they are not driven purely by material needs or no, by, they are ex- exo biological no. parasites. The Gnostic intel, both then and today in my update and extrapolation of it, it tells you exactly what they are in great detail. I've written masses about this. Mm. And I'm very happy for you to say that. It's better that you said that than I did, uh, that you know what you find in my book contains something that perhaps the heathen and pagan advocates can't find. But I want to add this qualification. I I don't have the opportunity, as I said at the beginning, it's tragic. Where's the conversation? I haven't had the opportunity to meet you and talk to you, my heathen and pagan brothers and sisters. And I regret if I'm misrepresenting your views in any way or appear to be dissing or discounting you. I have no intention, but we need to get to know each other a little better. Yeah, John, John, you know, just to make it clear to anyone who who may, this may be their first, uh, you know, introduction to John, their first exposure, just to make it clear, John has nothing but um, but love and regards for the European folk and the European traditions. <clears throat> I adore them mm. and I carry them in my heart every day. We in my, with my friends, like right now here, fortunately, I usually live in relative isolation and retreat. But now there's uh, some people visiting who are uh, practitioners of planetary Tantra and the live, I call it the living gnosis today. And we just, we pour our hearts out about this. We were talking about it last night for hours. You know, how are the indigenous peoples all over Europe, you know, the Basques, the Danes, uh, the, the Swedes, the, uh, I'm here in Galicia. Do you know that the Spanish people in Galicia, northern Spain, don't consider themselves to be Spanish? They consider mm. themselves to be Celtic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yet, when you walk around the fields here, when, there are some dolmens here and there. I am sure that this farmland in northern Spain must have been a dolmen paradise. But when you walk around the fields here, as I do very often, 
I can sort of see, oh, there might have been a, a dolmen there. There might have been a man here, there. But they've all been demolished. It, it, it's like this is the greatest tragedy that's overcome the human race. How mm. are we going to recover these roots? You say, and and yeah, if you know, if I could just change gears slightly there, because what, sure. what you what you said there, and what Rob said a little earlier about the solution to what we're going through now, actually, I think you could make a very very strong case that they also argue uh, for Gnosticism being a, a life affirming, world affirming. Um, worldview, because if you, if, if we know that our enemies are destroying such things as the dolmens, we know that they've done yes. that through thousands of years. If yes. they, if if they were, you know, part of this force responsible for creating this material world, then why would they be doing that? Why would they exactly. be destroying nature? Exactly. And you know, Rob, as Rob said, we. You know, we all instinctively know we, you know, there's there's no doubt in our minds, people like us, that in order to escape the madness that we're currently, this archontic madness that we're um we're suffering under at the moment, in order to, to escape that, we need to return to the earth. We ground ourselves and we immediately feel better. If the earth itself were part of this this uh evil negative illusion, then how could that possibly be the case? Exactly. The more that you have the opportunity. And I am sad. Uh, I'm not mad, but I have been really angry with people like Jay Widener and Graham. You know, not personal. Uh, angry on a professional level mm. because they're disingenuous. Okay, but I. It would be so great if people could get to hear this other version of narcissism because it would just click in. It makes so much sense. I was just reviewing a book last night by uh, Yamayuchi, who's a Gnostic scholar who looked deeply into uh, the roots of the Sophia myth and Iranian mythology. And as I was reading it, it occurred to me uh, that you can make, you can summarize the whole problem of the way Gnosticism and the Gnostic myth have been presented to the world in one simple example. And it like hit me like it was a you know, a Satori moment, I thought, yeah, this is what I have to tell people. Scholars of Judaism and Christianity take the disinformation and they build their Gnostic profile on the disinformation that comes out of antiquity. And the central factor in the narrative is the Demiurge. And they say the Demiurge is the satanic figure, Yahweh, Jehovah, who created the world, and the Gnostics viewed that as an evil event. But when you go, this is so hilarious, they're not reading the text, they're not seeing the forest for the trees. The Sophianic narrative says the Demiurge, which they call Yaldabaoth, okay, didn't create the world, he falsely claimed to create it. He pretends that he is the creator. It's about pretending. And I would say, look at the world today. Where is, how come this madness is so prominent? Because it's all about pretending. Boris Johnson said, pretend that you have the fucking virus. How could they be any <laughs> more obvious? <laughs> right? <laughs> Act as if you have it. That's the archon speaking. Could, could, could there be a more archontic instruction than that? I can't think of one, <laughs> honestly. Act as if you are sick, because we, the super race, the Elo Elohim, the Adamic race, the tribe that lives above you, we are your benevolent caretakers, and you must be sick in order for us to fulfill our role to correct the yeah. world. You see? Yeah. Can heathens understand what we're talking about here on the basis of their indigenous legend and lore? I think I think the the folkish aspect of, of heathens um, will be very much in alignment with what we're saying now. I think. Do folk, you? Well, that's good news. I'm yeah, really I, happy to hear that. I, I say I say that the folkish aspect because I, I mean, if you were to remove the the metaphysical aspect of heathenry. 
Um, I think their their more socio political side would very much gel with what we're saying here. Um, I think there is work to be done, perhaps on the metaphysical side of heathenry, uh, and it's something that I and and many of us are working on. Um, we we will uncover more and more truths, hopefully in collaboration with those who focus more on Gnosticism, like, such as yourself, John. You know, as as you both said, you know, we do need to sit around the fire together and. We do, um, and put, we we just need to to yeah. get together and talk. Yeah. Uh, on that note, what, yeah, go ahead, Rob. So I'll tell you what what kind of knits it together as well for me is like John John was was sort of very emph- em, emphatic about the idea or the reality that um, when when sort of Gnostic um, knowledge was alive and well throughout um, Europe and the Mediterranean. Uh, people could understand one another within these mystery schools without necessarily have, have to share the same language, but they could understand themselves, one another through symbols and and through um, their relationship to the stars and the natural world and all this kind of stuff. And we, that's what it's about. It's about, about saying it's almost like the comparative mythology angle, saying this this can represent that, or we can we have a common language. Um, we just need to say let's find out what that is and kind of re re um re piece the fragments that we've got of our deeply um broken um uh, mythology here in the in the west uh, find out find out what we were about you know what what how does this relate and one of the things that um i found initially difficult about um the gnostic stuff before before i came across john's work was really this idea about ah fuck here we go here's another pardon me but here's another sort of like mediterranean near east middle east kind of thing um which doesn't really bear any relationship on us and it's not until um he's saying well you know the druids could could talk with somebody from ancient alexandria and they would understand one another you know they they were they had the same kind of things going on so that's all we need to do is rediscover the language and the syntax, um, and we've got the conversation. It's good. It's healthy. It's excellent what you say, Rob, and I can double down on it by saying it's not something that we have to do. It's being done. It's an accomplishment today. It is happening already on the basis of the restoration of the Gnostic myth of the Sophia and the updating, bringing forward the Gnostic intel so we can apply it in the world today. All of this is happening. And within that movement, uh, the whatever remains to be uh, salvaged from these obliterated ancestral legacies can be brought to the table. But I don't find that the, that the body of those ancient legacies as it stands on its own is coherent enough and powerful enough to answer the problem of today. You are absolutely right. I point out in my book, and I give footnotes and extensive evidence in ancient sources that the Druids in Hibernia taught the Hibernian mysteries, but they went to Egypt and conversed with the Egyptian uh, astronomers, and the common language was the stars, the language of the stars. And that is, as you know, Rob, one of the primary things that I teach. You say, I teach sidereal mythology. I teach how to read the mythological code in the constellations and not just interpret it, but to use it to direct your life. That's why I call it directive mythology. Is this the same sort sort of principle as the language of the birds, which was known amongst um, alchemists? I don't know. Mm. To me, that's an obscure trope. It may have been. I don't know. What does the language of the birds refer to? Does it refer to a mystical experience of hearing certain um, it's, it, suboral it, frequencies that are like chirping sounds? I think it, I don't I th- know. I think it's more of a symbolic thing to say that when you are a master alchemist, then you can understand the birds. It's um, you know, I'm just uh, I don't know if there was literally some kind of means of communication between alchemists from different. Uh, cultures and traditions, um, or whether it was just a way of saying that if you were a master alchemist, then you understood nature and therefore you understood the language of the birds. 
Well, yes, but you don't have to be an alchemist to talk to the birds or the dogs, do you? You don't have to be. No, people, true. sensitive people who are grounded and recognize the enormous importance of our communication with non-human species, they can already do that. You don't have to construct it into a program of alchemy, even though, I must add, that is exactly what I've done. I probably spent a third of my whole life writing about alchemy. There's a course on Nemethu called Gaian Alchemy, and it goes into the alchemical processes of nature and the human psyche uh, with the criteria of Gnosis. Gnosis presents criteria. You know, what is Gnosticism? What is Gnosis? Gnosticism is an ancient movement. We're not going there. This is not a nostalgia trip. What is the living Gnosis today? I define it in two ways. First of all, it's applied noetics, period. So if you would go and investigate on a search engine, what is noetics? What is noetic psychology? You'll find that it is the psychology of consciousness, of cognition and perception. It is the study of how consciousness and perception works. That's noetics. Gnosis today is applied noetics. That's one definition. The other definition is that it is cognitive ecstasy, which means that today there is an element within the practice of gnosis that involves the use of entheogenic plants, as was done in the ancient mysteries. And I make a big case about this in my book. I show that the Gnostic schools in the various regions of Europe and the Mediterranean used various kinds of entheogenic plants. Why? Well, I put it this way, my friends. Our divine mother, Sophia, knew that we have a problem with the archons, that there is an exobiological extraterrestrial parasite who preys on our minds. She knew that, and she knew that there was a risk that they would drive us insane. And so she produced out of her body a certain category of plants which are heavily nitrogen bearing. And these plants have psychomimetic and psychoactive properties. And they are there to help us heal the insanity that we face due to the attack of these mind parasites. And the Gnostics knew this deeply. And that is why they used entheogenic potions to go into a state which I call a telestic trance. And in this trance, they were actually in a state of ecstasy. And there are certain things that it can only be known in ecstasy. You cannot know them in an ordinary state of mind. You have to know them in a non-ordinary state. And so I've built that. That is a huge component of the Gnosis today. It, am I getting across the picture of how rich this is and how diverse it is? But it's all grounded on the narrative. You have to know the narrative because that brings everything together and guides your experience of spirituality. Yeah, and I think what you've you've just outla outlined there is a great example of counter mimicry because in our modern times we see these naturally occurring entheogens. Um, we we see mankind being dissuaded from them, whilst at the same time uh, these man made drugs are pushed upon them. These uh, these um, you know these poor copies these. Or, you know, you could almost call them archontic copies. Yeah, I would call them pharmaceutical products, yeah. right? Yeah. If pharmaceutical products are archontic tools, yeah. look at the misery and the sickness and insanity that they have produced in this world under the guise of healing and helping us. I want to highlight that the hype, the self-hype of the archonic proxies in our midst, the tribalists, who carry the archonic evil into our midst because it is a human evil, they always hype themselves as benefactors. Yeah, we've got <laughs> all this medical technology. We're going to save lives. How many times have you heard save lives? I don't want to ever hear that those two words again in the same sentence. 
Because it's a con. It's a psyop. What gave it away to me? Yeah. Yeah. What gave it away to me during this whole um, COVID psyop is this whole thing about um, how concerned they were for the um, for the median age, eighty two or eighty three year olds with with several different. Um, uh, co- comorbidities. It's like we've really got to save these people. It's like you didn't give a toss about these people before. There's no, there's no reason why you should ever care about them anyway, because they're they're a burden, you know. So they tried to convince us first of all, you should be saving Granny. It's well, Granny financially and in every in every other respect, there is a burden on their their worldview as it is. So you could tell that the hoax was on from that minute, really. Yeah, you could say in a way that the COVID psyop. Uh, I call it Koviet, combining COVID with Soviet, because it is <laughs> okay, yeah. it is communism, folks. Yeah. Communism is the greatest evil in the world. Communism is the product of the archonic mindset. Okay, this is yeah. what you learn. Yeah. So, yeah, you could say that the whole COVID psyop was a gift in that it blew open. It makes it so obvious the fraud and the hypocrisy of the authorities. You see? Mm. Gnosis is anti-archon meaning anti-authorities because the translation of the word archon is authorities or rulers so it is anarchistic but i would point out and i am an anarchist but i would point out that anarchy means without rulers it does not mean without rules yes yeah Mark Passio, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Mark Passio, but he does uh, some excellent presentations on exactly that, talking about natural law and the importance of natural law, um, whilst at the same time heavily promoting anarchism. Right. So these are all, you know, we're like three, we're the three witches of Macbeth here, you know, (laughs) sitting around the steaming cauldron and throwing in an eye of newt and a leg of frog and throwing in all these things. It's all one big cauldron. That is the cauldron of Kerdwin. That is the sacred cauldron uh, of Scandinavian myth. What is it called? Uh, there's, uh, the, there's the well, Mimir's Brunner. It's w- Mimir's Brunner. Mimir's well, yeah. But it's also, there's a name for the cauldron uh, uh, in Hamlet's Mill. What is the name for that? The cauldron of the Scandinavian witch. The cauldron is the biosphere of the earth, Hmm. and the human psyche is part of that biosphere. I teach in Gaia and Alchemy that there is no difference between the phenomena of nature outside, dew, rain, frost, grass growing, things rotting. There's no difference between those phenomena and the phenomena in the human psyche. The human psyche is an act of nature as much as an apple growing on a tree that that, that's that's a profound thing to say especially when you tie that into alchemy because alchemy is something where people believe that you're trying to turn something into gold that's most people assume that that's all that alchemy is whereas real alchemy is the transformation of the mind and the spirit it's it's real alchemy is the practice the conscious and deliberate practice of the interactivity of nature and psyche Mm. That's what it is. And if I might, I don't like to promote myself, but at this point, it seems inevitable. No, please don't, John. Please do. Anyone can go to nemeta.org, N-E-M-E-T-A. By the way, nemeta is the plural of the word nematon. And nematon means a sacred grove. And originally, all the indigenous peoples who are our, our beloved ancestors, uh, whether they be in Scandinavia, Greece, Italy, Spain, or in the Middle East, practice in groves with megalithic structures. Gradually, that evolved into kind of temple structures, you see? So we go back to the sacred groves. When you go to Nemeta, you go back to the sacred groves of your ancestors. And everything on Nemeta, if you, if you just come on it as a pedestrian off the street, there are landing pages for 12 different courses, one of which is Gaian Alchemy. And anyone can read everything that's on that landing page and often listen to a recorded message so that you can learn what's happening in the school, even before you consider maybe going a little bit deeper and getting involved in the school. 
Uh, so I, I want to point that out. You know, I've been teaching alchemy since I can't even remember when. When I was 10 years old, I discovered alchemy. And I've been obsessed with it ever since. But the alchemy that you find on Nemeta is not like you read in A.E. Waite or Aleister Crowley or any of these other uh, freak occultists. You know, I'm an occultist, but I'm not that kind of occultist because <laughs> my occultism is based in the recognition that the natural world is an expression of the supernatural. There's no difference between the natural and the supernatural. The natural world, as you see it, is an expression or eruption of the supernatural. And the yeah. more deeply you participate in the natural world, the more you come to know the supernatural, which is also operating in your own psyche. And this is the education, the higher education that you can find at Namata. Right. Um, we've really, there's one more subject which I wanted to touch upon tonight. And I, I think this is, um, this is quite prudent to do because of the, the kind of people that will be listening to this. I can tell now there are going to be accusations or cries of, um, you know, universalism or syncreti right. syncretism, you know, people right. who, who are people, folkish, folkish heathens and folkish pagans are um, instinctively knee-jerk reactionary, uh, you know, against in in opposition to this idea of merging different traditions. Um, you know, sometimes some people are a little more open-minded and will draw upon Vedic law and bring that a little bit into European paganism. Um, some people are a bit more hardline about it. So John is not a universalist as you know, most people listening would understand the word. Um, so with what we've talked about this evening, how can we um, avoid the charge of being accused of promoting universalism? Brilliant, brilliant. Well, I'll see if I can <clears throat> take a sober moment to address that. Probably would have to uh, concisely make three points. First point I would make is that I developed in not in his image in the opening chapters, six chapters, uh, a very careful description of what the mysteries were. And I explained that the mysteries were a network all over Europe, Northern and Southern Europe, around the Mediterranean basin and into the Middle East. And I emphasized that the people in the Middle East who were actually the, the guide, the original originators of the mysteries, the Gnostics, were Aryans, okay? They yeah. were not whatever else or whoever else is living in the Middle East today. No, they were from the root stock of the Aryan Caucasian peoples. And so they were cousins to the Teutons and the Scandinavian peoples and the Iberic peoples and the Greeks were all one big family. And I emphasize that in every area, say, out in the Outer Hebrides, where you go to Kalanish, or you go to a stone circle uh, of the, uh, in France of the many, Karnak, or you go to megalithic sites uh, on Malta, or you go wherever you want to go, the mysteries were adapted bioregionally. So they met the needs of the people in the region where they arose, but they were organized in a generic way so that there was a common foundation, but each area, each people, each race had its own particular expressions. Yes. Now, I would answer to that objection. I, I Believe me, I take that objection really seriously. And I make no, I pull no punches. If you go listen to some of my talks on my channel, John Lamb Lash, why I am against universalism. I hate universalism, and I have exposed it, I believe, more than anyone else, more deeply than anyone else. But there is a, it seems to be universalism that I'm talking about. I can see how people would read it that way. And you're very right to bring this up, Dan, but it isn't. It's just the recognition that there is a generic grounding of our species. We are generically grounded in the species and we unfold in a spectrum of races and indigenous cultures. So Gnosis takes you back 
to the generic genomic foundation of human identity. And in that sense, it is universalist, but it does not preach a universalist agenda of equality, inclusion. No, it is extremely against, uh, opposed to that propaganda, which is coming from the globalist mindset. It's, it's, I really am so happy that you raised that objection because I don't want people to go away with the wrong impression. I absolutely am one of the biggest warriors fighting against universalism, you know, that's around as far as I know. I yeah. hate it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's despicable. Rob, do you, do you have anything to add on this at all? No, I just, I, I just I, I'm kind of um, a bit awestruck about some of the things we've been talking about to, 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 to tonight. And uh, well, it's just, it went deep. Yeah. yeah it's good. very, very deep. And, just abs absolutely brilliant. Like uh, my little mind is fizzling away here. Uh, very inspired by the conversation. I'm and also I'm, really hopeful as well. Sorry? I'm really happy that you say that because it is deep. It starts deep. You know, one of the things I say when I teach the living gnosis today is, or uh, when I teach planetary tantra, and I've made a beautiful merge of tantra and gnosis, by the way, which is unique and never happened before. I say, look, in this teaching, we immediately go to the depths and we immediately take it from the top. It's extremely intense. There's yeah. no gradation. There's no hierarchy. There's no, well, I'll teach you this now. And if you learn that, I'll teach you something else tomorrow. We go to the core. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I you understand what, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. Go on. Finish, please, John. Well, one thing that's important, if anyone is interested after hearing me blow off in my usual arrogant and grandiose manner, uh, <laughs> If if anyone is interested in putting me aside and knowing what the truth is, then you go to sophianicmyth.org and there is a four minute clip that explains the Sophianic narrative. Uh, just four minutes, a beautiful narration and a montage of images. And if you choose to uh, subscribe, you can receive the full Sophianic myth uh, chapter by chapter, the nine episodes of it, uh, once I think they're sent out once every five days or something. So there's an opportunity, apart from reading it in the book, there's an opportunity to learn what the myth is. And I want to point out that when you go to that page, Sophianic Myth, you'll see that there is an orientation talk, which is really important. And there's the, the text of the orientation talk. And in that text, I describe this issue uh, of the indigenous lore and mythology of the Irish, Welsh, Basque, Germanic peoples, all the indigenous peoples of Europe being in such a jumbled and incoherent condition due to having been so brutally attacked. And then I say that the Sophianic myth is the way to reconfigure them to reconfigure them today and bring them forward, not just go back to the ancient ways, but bring those ancient ways forward so that we can meet and overcome this horrific transhumanist agenda. Mm. If, if I could just um, offer my, briefly offer my uh, take on that last point on, uh, on universalism. Um, I think it's important to point out firstly that there is such a thing as a, a wider Indo-European tradition yes. and that Gnostic law belongs to it. Uh, yeah. And I think that's something that a lot of people who are new to Gnosticism, that, that will surprise them. A lot yes. of people will have the misunderstanding that no, the, the Gnostic texts come from outside of the Indo-European tradition, that they are Semitic or they are, you know, Arabic or North African or, or whatever. Um, they come from the Indo-European tradition. So that, that's a really important thing to point out. And they are anti-Semitic. And I've explained what it means to be anti-Semitic in a talk that I've done. Yeah. See, Semitic is not a racial designation. So if you are accused of being anti-Semitic uh, and the people who make that ac accusation, who, who condemn you for that, are using the term incorrectly, because it's not racial, it's a linguistic definition. Yeah. So 
the Semitic peoples of the ancient e uh, Middle East, who were not the founders of Gnosis, spoke, identified themselves by speaking three languages, which are Hebrew, Arabic, and Aramaic. Those are the Semitic languages. And I have said openly, yeah, I am really anti-Semitic. Why? Because I am opposed to the ideology that comes into the world through those three languages. The su those su supremacist ideology that comes racial in. Racial yeah. supremacist ideology, yeah. which is Hebrew. The ideology of enslavement and submission, which is Muslim. And the ideology of the Christian uh, savior, Messiah, which is just another version of Judaism, which is Aramaic. Because if any Jesus figure existed, it was in the, the linguistic culture that spoke Aramaic. Those three languages are encoded with malware and everything, and I mean everything that has come into the world through the Semitic languages is uh, to the advantage of the archons. So yeah, I am against those languages. Is it, there's an interesting quote, which I uh, noted down to that, that I found, I thought might be relevant at some point, which is uh there was a, a professor of Jewish mysticism called Gershom Sholem. Yeah, I know and him you probably well. know it, right? Yeah. yeah. And he, he once described Gnosticism as the greatest case of metaphysical anti Semitism. Did he? So he did. He did. <laughs> and good. so there you go. Anyone who thinks that Gnosticism is somehow from the Judaic tradition, um, you're wrong. That's absolutely true. And there are, by the way, this is another problem. An intelligent person, uh, Sincerely seeking the truth, you know, is looking at books on Gnosticism on Amazon or in a bookstore. Bookstores still exist. And yeah, you're going to fall across books by authors like Pearson, who argue that Gnosticism was a Jewish product. And if that's the first book you read on Gnosticism, it's very unfortunate for you yeah. because you're being misled, <laughs> you say. I have had to work through this stuff. I mean, sorting out all this stuff and getting to the core message of Gnosticism is, took on, on my life. You know, not, not in his image didn't come out until I was like 61, you know. Mm. Well, um, unless either of you have got any uh, uh, leftover points that you'd like to make, which I'd, I'd gladly sit and listen to, um, then I think we're, uh, we're done there for, for this conversation. And um yeah, like Rob, it blew my mind. It was it was brilliant. And um, I'm really grateful to both of you for making time for, for doing this. And maybe we can do another one sometime. Certainly. Let's see if the, uh, the we three witches uh, sitting around the, call, uh, the cauldron uh, have stirred up uh, a brew. And maybe the aromas and the fumes of that brew will go out and, and, and reach our pagan and heathen allies out there. I would deeply wish that to be the case yes so would i yeah Clint. well thank you both yeah. and we will do some more sometime later i would love it thank you so much john yeah the, the feeling from this dan and john is like this this you've just opened up a whole world of discussion here and it's great very positive yeah thank Thanks you so much for involved. thank you thank Rob. you both okay thank you good night good night no no for more information about john's work visit his odyssey or youtube channels under his full name, John Lamb Lash, as well as his online school, nemeta.org, N-E-M-E-T-A dot org. Not in his image and other of his books are available from most good retailers. If you'd like to hear more from Rob, you can listen back to the two conversations he and I have had on the Fergan Odyssey and YouTube channels. His music and lyrics for Tower Cross are also both enjoyable and insightful. This podcast has its home at fergen.com, F-Y-R-G-E-N.com, and my most active channel can be found on the Telegram app. Last but not least, it's time for the riddle section. So for those who are unfamiliar with the Fergen podcast, each episode I read out a riddle from the Exeter Riddle Book, a collection of old English riddles. Last episode was number seven, and the answer to that riddle was a swan. Now, I suppose this, uh, this is given away somewhat by uh, certain clues in lines such as 
um, to ruffle the waters or my white pinions or um, even a traveling spirit as our ancestors would have seen swans as being somewhat ethereal, um, sacred animals. So it's not such an obvious one, but it's as with many of these riddles, once you know the answer, it does seem quite obvious. So the next riddle, riddle number eight for episode number eight, is as follows. I've one mouth but many voices. I dissemble and often change my tune. I declaim my deathless melodies. I don't desist from my refrain. Aged evening songster, I entertain men in their homes by rehearsing my whole repertoire. They sit, bowed down, quiet in their houses. Guess my name, I who mimic the jester's japes, as loudly as I can, and rejoice men with choicest songs in various voices. That's all for this episode of the Fergan Podcast, and uh, I hope to be speaking to you all again in the next episode. Be well until then. Oh, yeah.